everybody for, for coming today. Um, we want to welcome you to Myositis Empower Hour, which was formerly known as Live with the Landmans. Um, we're going to kick off the Myositis Empower Walk with style and chat with somebody very empowering and special to you and to our family. Um, before we get started, though, we'd like to introduce ourselves for anyone who is new to MSU. We're Jenna and Lauren Landman, creators of the Myositis Empower Walk. Our family created the Empower Walk in loving memory of our dad who passed away from complications of dermatomyositis in 2015. And to honor his life and fight for all the myositis warriors, we decided to turn our storm into a rainbow and help raise awareness of these rare illnesses. Thanks to all of you, we are doing just that. It is truly an honor to fight for you and with you. Thank you for allowing our family to be a part of your myositis journey. Enough about us. We're going to kick off the Empower Hour and start chatting with Jerry Williams. Jerry is the founder and president of MSU and is living with dermatomyositis. He started MSU over seven years ago to raise awareness and provide support to the myositis community. Um, so we just wanted to welcome Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Hi, everyone. So great to be here. Thank you. Uh, Jenna and Lauren, you're beautiful people. And uh, just remember that we cannot thank you enough for all that you do. You're, you're so sweet, Jerry. Um, but we're really happy to have you with us today um, because you mean so much to our family and the, the myositis community. In fact, you are more than just our friend. You have become family. Um, and we appreciate you being vulnerable with us today and sharing your story with us. Yes, yes. To echo what Lauren said, you truly are family to us. So to start it off, Jerry, we'd like to ask you, when did your first, um, your symptoms first begin? And what was that experience like? Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, my experience and symptoms, I, I started with skin symptoms about two years before any muscle symptoms came about. So it was a, uh, you know, my doctor, my dermatologist wasn't connected with my local hospital. So um, the two were never connected until about four years ago. Um, so those initial symptoms were, you know, I would, if I was anywhere near the sun, even like in the car or in my house, I would break out in rashes. I had terrible uh, scalp rashes and, you know, that would bleed. And I mean, it was just, it was just horrible. And the, you know, the symptoms, I was being treated with prednisone for that. So it, it worked well, um, I responded well, but about two years later, um, I started having muscle pain and that was my first um, or my next symptom uh, followed by muscle weakness. I was working too hard. I was always, you know, a very hard worker um, and I played hard too, you know, so I, I figured <laughs> my body is just uh, getting older at 25 uh, okay. and I need to give it more care. Um, the muscle weakness um, came on about two to three weeks after, and I ended up collapsing on my parents' porch about a month in. And I was uh, taken, you know, to a to you know a hospital where I was input or excuse me inpatient for ten days, and they tested for everything, you know, no no findings and and so forth. And so that's what you know the symptoms really were: uh, a lot of pain, fatigue, um, you know, just not feeling well and then all of a sudden you know muscle can collapse you know we we do know from experience and many in the myositis community know this as well but it can take a very long time to be accurately diagnosed so when were you first officially diagnosed with myositis and how long did it take to find those answers well i was officially diagnosed um in 2005 with a muscle biopsy um it be in 2003 is when the symptoms really uh, with the muscle weakness and stuff really started. So it was about a three, three year period um, as far as, you know, getting that diagnosis. And, you know, there was, there were a lot of things that impacted that, um, you know, my blood work was always normal. So I didn't have the traditional CPK, uh, high CPK levels that you see with myositis and a lot of people. I didn't have uh, any of the antibodies, which I was tested for many years later. Um, you know, I, I didn't have the traditional symptoms of a myositis. It wasn't until after the, um, I had collapsed, went to a 10 day uh, stay in a local hospital. Then I went to another university hospital where I was discharged in a wheelchair with psychosomatic illness. They you know, told me this was all in my head. My primary care doctor, when he got that piece of paper, 
you know, he was, he was the one, you know, kind of guiding my treatment. Right. So, um, he took that and made that official and, you know, said that, Hey, you know, you have to go see a psychiatrist now. And that held up about six months of my care, um, because I had to see a psychiatrist for, you know, various sessions and, you know, prove that, you know, I guess that this, I'm not making this up. Um, so that was very hard. And the fact that uh, as a gay man, my primary care physician is also a uh, infectious disease doctor. And he was convinced that I had HIV because I'm a gay man. Some of the symptoms, you know, fit. So he was convinced and that held up six months of my care as he was doing specialized testing. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, hurry up and wait and a lot of no answers and pushing me, you know, to, you know, another doctor and another doctor and another doctor until a new rheumatologist came to my little local town and I went to see him figuring why not? And he said, the first question that he asked was, have you had a muscle biopsy? And then it clicked. Every, I had had a biopsy of everything else under the sun, except my muscles. And that's when I finally got a diagnosis. At the time, it took three years for me to really get a diagnosis. And, you know, at the time, I thought it was a long time, right? But when you look at the average diagnosis now, it's like, what, three to seven years. So I guess I'm kind of one of the lucky ones. Um, mm -hmm. I thought at the time it was, you know, it was just unbearable um, having to leave work, um, you know, all of the, the things that the diagnosis, you know, put into my head, right? I, I finally had the diagnosis of this rare disease. There wasn't much out there about it to know about it. Um, and, you know, I guess it was just a, yeah, I guess I should say just end that question with, yeah, 2005 was the official diagnosis. Yeah, that, that can be so challenging and, and just working with medical professionals and just trying to find that answer. It's just, it's probably just a mix of emotions and, and so many things that you're just trying to process. Um, and if you'd be willing, you've kind of touched on this just a little bit, if we can kind of dive a little bit more Um would you be willing to share some of the difficult symptoms or complications of DM that you've experienced along your entire journey? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, through, through all of the complications that I've been through, um, I have found strength. I, I want to just start with that because I don't want to scare anyone. Um, if you're newly diagnosed, um, not all of these things will happen to you. Um, some of them are likely never going to happen to you, I hope. Um, but, you know, when I finally got the diagnosis and they started treating me with <clears throat> really strong uh, immune suppression drugs, um, there were a couple, well, quite a few things that happened. Um, I began to get serious infections. Uh, there was a point where I had meningitis with encephalitis, um, having grand mal seizures, and I was on a vent for about 10 to 12 days, and uh, they didn't expect me to make it. But we had a group then, and the group was fighting for me. I saw all the messages after I woke up and uh, it, it was amazing the support that was provided. Um, I've also had a perforated colon. I had to have emergency surgery to remove half of it and several feet of my intestine. Um, I had a really huge flare where I lost 90 pounds in about a month. My body wasn't absorbing protein and they still didn't figure it out, um, but I had to fight to get um, proper care. Um, I needed IV nutrition and, you know, I had to have a peg tube and, you know, so many of those wonderful, wonderful things that a lot of some, some people, you know, I know with myositis, you know, have those peg tubes. So um, I, I did have that. And I was also diagnosed with myelofibrosis um, around that time. Um, and the cancer center voted three to two to hold off on a bone marrow transplant uh, to try uh, a different medication. And I've been in remission uh, from that for five years now. So um, mm -hmm. I'm thankful for that. <laughs> it's very, very helpful. And I've also had a couple of strokes um, that the doctors uh, kind of chalk up to IVIG being infused too quickly. Mm. So uh, quite a few complications, but you know, I'm, I'm here, I made it through each one of those and you know there was an, another complication that was really the one 
that sticks with me today and has caused me medical PTSD is <clears throat> I had a drainage tube after that surgery. Um, and the drainage tube, without anesthesia, just some numbing of the skin, they this you know pencil-sized catheter into the back so they could get inside um, the, the abdomen, the cavity there to drain. Mm -hmm. When they pulled the catheter or that catheter drainage tube out, that day, it was supposed to be done in the surgeon's office. She called me in the morning and said, can you please go to interventional radiology at the hospital and have it removed today? Because I'm going to be in emergency surgery. When they pulled the tube, it tore my iliac artery in half. And oh. I was immediately bleeding out into my abdomen. And it was one of those I was in and out of it. For, for a little while. And I remember the surgeon coming into my ear as he was placing uh, a central line. You're going to be okay, Jerry. I've got you. I've got you. And then I hear code blue. And then there's, you know, I can just remember the chain of blood bags. They were just rushing blood. And it was, you know, I smile because I deal with humor. Um, mm -hmm. Things through humor. I don't think it's funny. Um, but, you know, it still causes me nightmares sometimes uh, to this day. So, yeah, <laughs> a little more than you asked. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, we appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing your experience and what you went through. And we're so glad you're here with us today. Um, you know, just just know that by sharing that you are helping so many people. Um, and yeah, just hearing the, the pain that you went through, it, it just really saddens me. But this is why, you know, we do what we do. We want to raise awareness and, and advocate for all of our myositis warriors and their care partners. So, um, you know, that's why, why we're here. And, um, you know, as you were going through that, um, you, you know, you may have felt alone. How did your official diagnosis and, um, you know, that feeling of wanting to build that supportive community to not feel that way lead to the creation of the myositis um, support and understanding? Yeah, so after, you know, I had a diagnosis for a while um, in around 2010 is when I decided uh, that, you know, I was I was lonely. I was alone. I uh, didn't know anybody else. I finally had a name for what I was living with, um, but there wasn't much out there either, whether it's education or support. Um, you know, this was like in 2005-ish. Uh, so in those five years, you know, I was dealing with my disease, coping with who I was now, you know, since I could no longer work a full-time job and being on social security disability. Um, and, you know, all of, all of those big life changes. And then I, I wish I could remember what the impetus was that day, but I went ahead and created the group. And that is where everything just kind of took off. And over, you know, the first, I would say, year is when I learned so much about myositis and how it affects care partners and how it affects different patients with different types and you know it was so important and then we started to see the common themes that we needed more connection we needed more support um, and that's kind of uh, where then the idea of a nonprofit uh, kind of came to be for me that's uh, very impactful and, and similar to us. You took a storm and you made it into a rainbow, yes. um, right? And and I think that's what's so powerful about your story is while you were feeling isolated and alone, you took it upon yourself to build that community. And now others in, in the whole world really have a place that they can find that community. So what you've done is just amazing. Um, and we're just so grateful. Um, and uh, kind of going off the support aspect, uh, what did support look like from your family and your friends when you were going through your diagnosis, your entire journey? Um, and then how has your husband been supportive through this entire process? So for, for my family and friends, um, you know, when you're young and diagnosed um, with a chronic debilitating illness, you know, your life changes. Um, I was no longer able to go out and party, um, just leaving the house was you know a big to do um and i ended up losing a lot of friends but you know i i kind of kind of air quote that because you know my true friends have stuck around and while you know we may not 
talk as often as we did. I mean, I don't lead a very exciting life. Um, you know, I'm pretty much here with my dogs all day. Um, <laughs> so there's not really much to talk about. Um, but, you know, the true friends uh, have really have stuck by me. Um, and one of my friends told me that she just can't look at me like this. Mm. That's why she doesn't come around. So that an, was an interesting, you know, kind of conundrum for me because I thought we were a lot closer than that. So, yeah. but you know, everybody has to take care of themselves, right? So if it's not something that she could deal with, you know, I've come to come to terms with that and it is what it is. My family, um, you know, before my mom passed away, um, God bless her. She was a, a wonderful woman, reminds me a lot of like your mom, just Aww. like a loving, you just, you know, her spirit, her smile, everything just, you know, <laughs> And she was my biggest uh, support and advocate throughout all of this. Um, and her, you know, and my stepdad had to stand up to my primary care doctor. And my stepdad told him, you're going to kill this effing boy. <laughs> so uh, that's when things really uh, started uh, getting serious with my uh, kind of <laughs> along the path of uh, <clears throat> diagnosis. Um, but, you know, my, my family, uh, I don't think they quite understand um, mm -hmm. because they're, you know, they invite me to things and, you know, it, and as much as I want to go, you know, each day is so different with this disease. You know, I could be laid up in bed one day, the next day I could be, you know, maybe like at a four on the pain scale and I'm able to do something, but it's so hard to plan, right? And that's something that, you know, they don't, they don't sometimes understand. And then what? What about your, your husband? I know that he's been very impactful on your journey and somebody that you lean on a lot. I'd love to hear a bit more about him. Yeah, so my husband's name is Charlie and uh, Charlie and I met right when I got sick. Uh, he was a dental assistant at my dentist and uh, <laughs> that's how we met. So very interesting uh, meeting. Uh, but, you know, he, like I said, he's been through, uh, excuse me, he's been through all of this with me, you know, all of the doctors and hospitals and um, you know, all of that stuff. And, you know, it's hard for me to do anything. Let me take that back. I can do a lot to show him how thankful and grateful I am. And I try to remember that in my scattered brain, um, you know, just helping me, you know, so a lot of the things that he does sometimes are um, kind of more indirect. And then I look at it and I'm like, oh, he was thinking of me, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. He's a he's a sweetheart. He's you know dealing with some things of his own. Uh, he's a recovering heroin addict, so he's you know just uh, he's working his you know his program for him, um, and I'm just uh, super proud of him for for doing that. So yeah, he's been a he's been a rock star. <laughs> We love to hear that. I mean, it's really important to have that support, whether that's from, you know, a spouse, a care partner, family and friends, or even those you meet through the Myosite support groups. I mean, you know, um, that's, it's very important to have, have those people to lean on and help you give you that strength. Um, and we also have a, a care appreciation, care partner appreciation day this Friday. So for anyone, you want to thank your care partner um, extra Friday is kind of our, our day for that. But um Kind of moving on to some other support that that you get i mean animals really have that ability to provide humans the extra love and and support when they need it the most and we know you have um some pets that you adore how have they helped you when you've you know might be having a hard day either mentally or physically how are how are they helpful in that matter my dogs are my children. <laughs> I think a lot of people understand that. And yes. a lot of people uh, who volunteer with MSU are animal lovers. So I always like to say we're, you know, we're, anim we're an animal love and nonprofit. Um, mm -hmm. I have, uh, right now I have two dachshunds, Dapper and Isabella, and they are a hot mess. Uh, <laughs> Dapper has recently, and I don't know if this is his intention, but he's been not wanting to come in from outside, forcing me to go outside and kind of chase him. <laughs> so I'm not sure if he's doing that to get me moving more <laughs> or if he's just being a bad boy, right? Um, but that's how dogs are. And I used we used to have um, our first dog, Rusty, who passed away. We had to have him put down a few years ago, but he was he was like my, my baby. And 
Um, to make a very long story short with him, he, I found after months of him doing this, he would, this was in the beginning of my journey when I was just starting to get treated for pain. He would wake me up in the middle of the night and he would walk out to the kitchen where I kept my medicine and, you know, come to find out once I took my pain medicine and went back to bed, then he would go back to bed. So it was like he was like, Daddy, you're gonna you gotta keep up on your pain meds or else you're gonna be in pain. You know, you have to <laughs> on top of it. So it was like the sweetest thing because I don't know what else it could have been, you know. <laughs> but they do, you know, they just sitting with them, um, and you know, they depend on me. So if nothing else, you know, I'm I have I have to get out of bed, right? I they have to be fed, they have to be outside and you know, so that I like having that that dependability and and just the you know the unconditional love oh my gosh it's it's a beautiful thing yeah um jen and i are both dog moms and i'm sure there's plenty of people watching and there's just something so special about having a pet and the love that they give um and especially if you're going some, through something difficult they just have a way to connect with you that i, I think humans can't so they are just very special and I'm very glad that they were able to provide that for you. And they, and they do. And, you know, whether they're being bad boys and trying to get you to go outside, I think that's so sweet. You know, they're just the sweetest things. Um, so this is a fun one, a fun question. Um, and we would love to know what are a few interests or hobbies that you have that maybe some people watching with us today don't know about? Well, let's <laughs> This is a this is a difficult one for me because uh, just in all honesty, um, I'm at a point in my life where I'm kind of trying to find that new normal again and finding again who I am and where I want to go and what, who I want to be and all of these different things and trying to find my joy again outside of working, you know, quote unquote, working and producing. Um, so some of the things that I've I've really been interested in and when I have free time, I always kind of just read articles about it's like the weather i really i really enjoy learning about the weather and and space and how all of the different planets and you know are made up of you know the different gases and different this and that it's just really interesting to me um so that's something that i've been kind of interested in yeah that that seems fun have you ever done anything where you've like stargazed or um or you do you hope to do something like that not really it's weird. It's like I like reading about it, but I don't see myself out there actually gazing. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> we all have different interests in, in right. how that makes us happy, but no, space is pretty crazy. So just reading about it's kind of enough. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so kind of moving on more into MSU and what you created with that, um, can you share a bit more about uh, the financial assistance program and how that helps? those all living with different forms of myositis and how that came to be. And just a little bit more about that. Yes. Happy to always happy to talk about the financial assistance program, um, which is uh, unique, even in the rare disease community uh, to have a, a nonprofit that has a program like this. So this program officially launched in 2017. Um, again, after, you know, seeing what the community needs were through having those support groups and continuing to have those, um, we knew that, you know, financial assistance was a need. So um, that was one of our, you know, kind of founding principles or whatever you might want to call it, founding programs was to include financial assistance. Um, so we offer uh, financial assistance. Uh, it's changed a little over the years, but uh, right now we offer it for uh, like costly mobility devices, um, uh, excuse me, medical bills that are related to myositis and, you know, treatment and emergency household um, expenses. So things like, you know, rent or mortgage or utility bills, you know, we don't want anyone out there that's in need to have to, you know, go without electric or, you know, because sometimes people have to choose between the electric bill and medications. You know, and it, it can be a really tough decision. So we want to be there to provide that support. And, you know, we reinforced that during COVID, um, you know, people were talking about the land, you know, the evictions and, and so forth. And it's something that I hope we can continue um, with the emergency household expense part going forward. But, you know, since the program launched in 2017, officially, we've uh, given over $320,000 in direct patient assistance. Wow. 
have mm. received such wonderful letters from some of these patients about how it saved their home or you know now they're more independent because they could afford a mobility you know, device or a toilet lift or you know whatever whatever the need is so that's that's a program the program is here to stay i can tell you that um that's you know that at the heart of msu that's awesome. I mean, it, it really truly shows that MSU is a patient-centered nonprofit organization. I mean, you're really helping helping those um, patients with that taking that pressure off, where you don't have to decide. You know, like you said, between uh, medications or bills, you have a little bit um, of pressure off of you. So that's just really amazing that you guys have incorporated that. Um, and since the Empower Walk is less than a week away, it's actually Saturday, we do have a question for you about it. How do you think the Myositis Empower Walk adds value to MSU's mission of improving the lives of and empowering those living with myositis? Well, the Empower Walk is, is unique. Um, you know, it's not just a, a walk because it's a walk first uh, in memory of your father and your family. <laughs> And, you know, that's one thing that makes it a unique experience and that you're providing a positive and uplifting community building event in his memory. Um, you know, it's about connecting people, right? And mm -hmm. in person, but also virtually. And that's the beauty of, you know, being able to have the live stream where we can all be a part of it together at the same time across the world. And I think that's, that value it, it creates excitement it creates um it creates feelings of love and comfort and belonging and your home um, and that's what the power walk does and you know having you and your family as part of our family you know has been uh, just an amazing experience you know you're you guys are connecting with other people on instagram and other platforms like email and you know you like you said um, at one point you know, you're fighting for and with us and that kind of love and support is exactly who we are so as the empower walk kind of is just a natural um it, it just seems so natural to have it uh, as part of part of msu and we're so grateful that to have met you all and really to have been welcomed with open arms. Everyone has been so kind to us and really accepted us into part of, you know, the myositis family. And so um, it, the walk has really become exactly what we wanted it to be. You know, we want it to be that uplifting, positive community building mm -hmm. event um, that everyone can feel supported. I mean, um, we want, we, worked off and built off of what MSU already did to kind of create this, this event. So um, yeah, we're just so grateful we can even be a part of the myositis family. And um, so we thank you for that. <laughs> um, we next wanna ask you if you can share the benefit of MSU being run entirely by volunteers and individuals living with myositis and how important that is um, to have patients involved in leading MSU's vision. Yeah, so you know that was one of the things um, in creating a nonprofit is okay, who's going to run it? <laughs> um, yeah. And I, you know, I really and I still do like the idea of having it all volunteer, and I I hope that we can continue it that way. You know, it can be difficult as we are growing so quickly, but um, having an all volunteer organization is you know there's so many members out there that like me years ago went on disability, I couldn't work full time, but I could still sit at the computer for a few hours here and there a day, right? So, you know, they're able, you know, gives, you know, it's like empowering opportunities for them to be involved and having the, the vo their voices in literally everything that we do, um, you know, whether it's moderating um, support groups or if it's back office work, finance work, whatever it is um you know it's it's a way for them to share their skills and you know volunteering helps us it makes us feel good to give back to others um so you know i i think a lot of volunteers um you know feel that way they feel you know like they're a part of the family and it, it it truly is now um having the patient voice you know that's um 
one thing, you know, how important do you think it is having patients involved? And that's, um, you know, when you, unfortunately, when you hire um, like outside staff, you create, you create a barrier to the community. And, you know, we, that's the benefit of being all volunteer and uh, patient led is that we are a part of the community ourselves. We're living with the disease. Um, we're in the support groups. We're out there, you know, really uh, as part of the community rather than um, a nonprofit expert that is just managing, you know what I'm saying? It, it kind of kind of takes that barrier away and allows us to be a more flexible, loving organization. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, I think um, just having that and, you know, what I've seen and what Jenna and I have had the privilege of is working with all amazing volunteers uh, to help us put on the Empower Walk. Um, we've been able to see a different side um, of the disease and, and different perspectives. Um, and I think that's been extremely rewarding and given us an opportunity we did not even think of. And so to, to Jerry's point, it is very um, impactful to be working and having this all patient led and volunteer led because it gives a voice the people that are dealing with it, they are the voice. And, and in, with an illness that is so rare, they need to be the ones screaming from the rooftops and, and saying like, you know, listen to me now. So we're very, we're really happy that we're a part of that and we get to work with all the amazing volunteers. Um, I think and, it's also, uh, just real quick, another yeah. you know, benefit to our donors is, you know, their money is used to directly impact myositis patient lives you know we don't mm -hmm. have rent or mortgage or utility you know we, we don't have we keep our overhead very low so that more money can go back to patients in need yes that's a very good point it goes mostly directly to those the patients that need it so you know when you're making a gift that you are making a big difference in somebody's life um could be night and day could be day you know and that's what's so important is that you know your gift is making a difference um okay so we know that Jen and I could probably list out all of your accomplishments right here because you're amazing and you've done so much. Um, but we would love to hear from you on how what you feel is your proudest accomplishment with MSU or your journey, um, anything you're willing to share that you're really proud of. Hmm. For those who know me, <laughs> they know that I do not like to talk about myself, but <laughs> I will. Uh, um, I think I would really have to list two things, um, if I were to be fair. Uh, first, uh, the fact that we have awarded that over $320,000 in patient assistance since 2017 is amazing to me. Looking mm -hmm. back at starting this nonprofit, you know, what I have ever thought in five, seven, well, almost seven years, uh, that, you know, that it's just an amazing um, accomplishment. And it's not only mine, it's those that co you know co-directors and the board and all of our volunteers who make all of that happen as well and then the second is our pain paper you know we did a uh, survey uh, back in 2019 about pain you know some doctors are, are still saying pain is not a part of myositis this pain paper shows that to be untrue pain is real with myositis and that's what this survey showed. So, you know, we had this survey, we had the data, and then our research team led by Lynn and uh, Manuel and with Emily uh, took it to, you know, the next stage. And we got this published in the prominent rheumatology journal, which is yeah. just another amazing accomplishment, right? And, you know, I, I just am, am very proud to have been a part of that. And, uh, you know, that paper is available um, to everybody. So take it to your doctor, let them, let them see um, what the findings are. So yeah, those are my, those are my two big things. Yeah. Those are pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell somebody who is newly diagnosed, uh, may have, may have just found MSU? What, what hopeful advice, what encouragement, what would you tell them right now? I would tell them uh, to get as connected as possible. Um, join join the groups. Um, we have you know the online groups on Facebook and on Inspire. 
We have clubhouse groups, which are audio only sessions. We have Zoom groups. Um, we have a book club now. We have a mindfulness room now. We have an LGBTQIA group, a men's group, a women's group. Um, so many, so many groups. Um, get connected and join. Um, and I hope to see you there. And the second thing is, you know, through through those experiences of joining those groups, you will learn um, if you don't already know how, but to self advocate and tips and you know little tricks that can help um, with advocacy um, when you're talking with your doctor and building a true relationship with your doctor, not just some transactional relationship, but you know you're truly building an equal partnership, and that's exactly what our medical advisor, uh, thankfully, uh, Dr. Salman Bai. Um, you know, that's, that's who he is as a, as a person and as a doctor. And uh, mm -hmm. thankfully, you know, he fits right into the MSU, um, that MSU culture. Just listing off all the support groups that you have <laughs> are amazing. And I think uh, that's what's so cool about MSU is that you can have something like a book club or, you know, we're mindfulness club where maybe it's, you know, you guys are all together because of your illness, but you do something that you like to do um, as just an individual. Um, and then you have a group of people that understand you and, and want the best for you. So I think that's amazing. Um, and I think great advice for somebody who is newly diagnosed. Um, and then I'll just add one more question, just in case we have any other uh, questions coming in, but do you, can you speak on behalf on anything with what MSU has done with regards to research um, and j just a little bit on that? Ooh, to say a little bit on research <laughs> will be hard, um, but yes, um, first, uh, people are asking where to find the pain paper. Um, so if you visit our website, uh, the, the pain paper is available. It's understandingmyositis.org. And if you click the research section, um, you'll find the paper listed there. If you scroll down a bit and there is a blog post, if you search, um, you can find the paper there. And we'll try to, I think Benita is going to get the link. Uh, yeah, Lynn put the link to the pain. So perfect. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, as far as as far as research, um, you know, research is Lynn's baby. <laughs> Lynn and Manuel mm -hmm. run our research team. Um, and they, they have brought on a whole new uh, side of MSU. You know, when you have patients leading research projects, how how valuable that is. And so, you know, some of the stuff that people might not know that we do, right? So some of the things, you know, we say, oh God, we're so busy. Well, here's some of the other stuff that's not like public, right? We work with pharmaceutical companies um, to like review clinical trial protocols, inform, you know, recently like informed consent, different documents to make sure um, you know, that they're being represented in the patient's voice and that they're, you know, using, so we do a lot of, I say a lot, but we do uh, quite a bit of, of that work with pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so that's sometimes interesting uh, to people to, to know that, you know, pharmaceutical companies are reaching out um, and they want to, they, a lot of them truly want the patient uh, to be, you know, at the center of all of this. And it's just about getting the trial to us before, you know, in a, in a preclinical stage so that we can truly make uh, an impact. Um, some of the other things on research, uh, again, the, the pain paper, um, we also uh, have the tendon transfer uh, trial that's going on for IBM hand function. Um, so we're really uh, proud to, to be able to have funded uh, that study. Um, and there's there's so much more going on, so many clinical trials right now for dermatomyositis, especially. Um, so that's an you know an awesome opportunity for for those that are listening. If you have dermatomyositis, um, check check out the different trials that are available. You have a lot of options uh, right now. So um, that's another thing that I would you know suggest to newly diagnosed is considering um, getting involved in medical research. And, you know even things like taking surveys, you know, that is, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, we can learn a lot. So um, when you see surveys come out, please, you know, from MSU, please take the, the time. Sometimes they're 10 minutes long, depending on the topic, but it really does make an impact on how we move forward. Kind of wrap it up. Um, and we just want to thank you, Jerry, for talking with us today. Your journey with myositis 
has made a tremendous impact for so many. Um, it's just unbelievable what you've done. Um, you took something so isolating and difficult and built an amazing, loving, supportive community that we can all depend on. Um, you really are all of our myositis rock star. Like you are, you are the one. <laughs> Yes, that is true. And we also want to thank everyone who is um, watching today, who want to tune into our live stream. Uh, we hope you enjoyed uh, our chat with Jerry and we hope it leaves you feeling inspired and ready for the Myositis and Power Walk. Um, it is this Saturday and we hope you'll join us for this community building event, um, either virtually or in person. Um, and so far we have raised, drum roll please. <laughs> $570. That is Woo amazing. Woo uh, we are so grateful for your support. So thank you to everyone who has donated so far. We truly appreciate you. Yes, thank you. It cannot be done without you, but there's still plenty of time to give if you haven't already. Um, you are able to start a fundraising team or you can join an existing one. Our goal is to raise $35,000 and I know that we can do it. It sounds crazy, but it it's been done. Um, so we just need your help. So please promote it on your social media platforms, share with your family and friends through text or email, or just simply spread the word um, by just sharing this with somebody. If you're unable to donate, that can impact somebody to join MSU, somebody to give. Um, it really does, word of mouth might be one of the most impactful ways to um, spread the word. Um, and it makes a difference and it helps us get closer to our goal. Donations that we get will benefit our all volunteer patient led nonprofit. Um, to support our pa uh, patient financial assistance program and um, the support and educational programs and patient-centered research projects, um, you know, all of that, that's part of the mission to improve the lives of um, those impacted by myositis. So if you're able to make a donation, um, even $5, $10, um, it truly makes an impact. Remember, MSU was built off of those um, type of donations, so it really does make a difference. Yes, it does. Thank you so much, Jenna, uh, for saying that. You know, I, I'm strapped financially. I'm on social security disability. So I donate, you know, 15, 20 bucks here and there. And setting up a recurring donation is also a great, great way. Say set up $10 a month and, you know, you're giving all year long and it does make a, a wonderful impact. So thank you both for having uh, me with you today. I really do appreciate it. And thank you all for watching. Yes, thank you. And don't forget to scroll down on the campaign page um, to make a donation. That's where our main fundraising campaign is. And we can't wait to rock and roll with you on Saturday. Yay. Yes. Yay, thank you so much, everyone. We are just so grateful to be a part of your journey. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.